the proceedings would not be complete this morning without our being able to announce that someone has left his lights on, his doors are locked. Uh, the prize goes this morning to license plate 5845, a Lakefield driver education car. It is reported that in October 1960, John F. Kennedy was disturbed by a revelation. He realized that between Richard Nixon and the presidency stood only one man, John F. Kennedy. It is also reported that thenceforth, Kennedy campaigned with new vigor. Between 1960 and 1967, between myself and the reception of a degree at the University of Chicago, stood six men. Joseph Sittler was one of those six men. And now, for a few minutes in 1971, I have no small satisfaction in being the only thing standing between Joseph Sittler and the delivery of a Nobel lecture. <laughs> Mr. Sittler received the A.B. at Wittenberg College and the B.D at Hama Divinity School, both in Springfield, Ohio, but neither with an academic reputation that is unambiguous. But that tells something about Mr. Sittler, whose reputation is not only unambiguous, but eminent. He did not earn that reputation by flashing big academic credentials at the right thresholds. He earned that reputation with a complex mind and a clear tongue. These have served him well in major lectureships at Harvard, Yale, Duke, and the Pacific School of Religion and as a delegate to the World Council of Churches in 1954 and 1961, and for the last 13 years as professor of systematic theology at the University of Chicago. He has written five books with a prophetic pen. As early as 1961, he wrote a book on ecology a kind of ecology which we, of which we are still unaware, uh, the ecology of faith. This was followed in 1964, seven years ago, by a book entitled The Care of the Earth, which, in one section at least, expressed a concern for nature which is uncharacteristic of Christians. Only recently have we become aware of the need for that kind of ecology. Presently, Mr. Sittler is working on a theology of ecology. The title of his most recent book, The Anguish of Preaching, strikes me as somewhat inappropriate. For if ever a man was qualified to adeptly serve as court preacher of the United States, it is Joseph Sittler. But I think that that position has already been filled.
Perhaps the caution expressed in the title, The Anguish of Preaching, is evident also in Mr. Sittler's title for today, The Perils of Futurist Thinking. Now, characteristically, we see little peril in futurist thinking. And commonsensically, we tend to think that futurists are optimists. At least they think that, that there is sufficient future time to warrant attention. But Mr. Sittler has subtitled his speech A Common Sense Reflection. Apparently, his ambient common sense withholds a total endorsement of the optimism of the futurist. But is it simply his native common sense which prompts such hesitation? Or does the fact that Sittler is a theologian rather than a scientist have something to do with his reflections? Perhaps we should now turn to Mr. Sittler. I have stood between you and him long enough. preliminary notices which came to all of us who are participating here this week made it quite clear and repetitively clear that the point of the conference was for the students. And in my preparation for proposals I should like to put before you in the next hour, I've tried to keep that in mind. One reason for keeping that in mind also is related to my very modest estimation of the academic lecture. We have at my university a number of endowed lectureships, and not long ago a very distinguished philosopher came on one of these <coughs> and gave a magnificent lecture, and there were eight students and two professors there. Now, he didn't seem to mind that, and nobody else seemed to mind it, because everybody understands what a lectureship is for. A lectureship is an academic device to pry out of a hesitant mind its best notions. And everybody knows that within two months of the lectureship it will be published, and therefore why sit on a bad seat and listen when in two months you can sit in a good chair and read? So that the academic lectureship as a performance has, has a, a limited use. And therefore each of us, I think, has in his own way understood this and has played fairly free with, with whatever text he proposed to bring to this conference, and I intend to do the same. But another reflection at the beginning is this. This 20 feet or so that separates that table from the students really might be called the generation gap. Uh, all of us at the table hold established positions in realms of discourse in which the data have been organized, methodologies refined, ways of thinking have acquired a certain stylized form, and therefore, because of that assumed competence, we are asked to come here and contribute to the discussion. But the irony of the matter is that the very components which constitute the legitimacy of our invitation are the very questionable assumptions which constitute the mind of the students. What the students are saying is, maybe that's not the way to think about the world. Maybe the way you guys have got your reputation and have worked in the past has not produced results which are so unquestionably magnificent that you ought to be talking about this matter at all to us. What I'm saying is, in a maybe overdramatic way, fashion is that there are certain assumptions which constitute the student mind to which we're supposed to be addressing ourselves 
which do not with equal clarity constitute the steady assumptions of the minds of those of us who are doing the talking. So I want to begin this morning by trying to live myself into the mind of the student who listens to all this and ask if there are certain questions which are constitutive of the style and temper of that mind in our time, which if not made public and not exposed at the outset, will lurk around incognito and haunt us in solitude when we shall have taken the plane or you shall have returned to your dormitories. Now these questions, which I think are thus far unexamined assumptions of the topic, are the ones I, I want to bring to the surface. They inhere in the statement of the topic itself. First, the assumption is that there will be a future for man. Now, despite the fact that there has been in the history of the world, history of the West, Christian groups which believed that there might be a future of a thousand years, uh, then there have been the Millerites in Upper New York State who were very clear about when the world would come to an end and were occasionally disappointed that it isn't. Despite the fact that there have been such guesses about the future, this is the first generation, I think, that has questioned the future as such. When I was in college, I had reason on the ground of my previous academic performance to question whether I had a very distinguished future. I had worries during my college career about how to prepare for what future might present itself to me as challenging. I had a good deal of worry about the number of possibilities that were there and how to come to a choice among them, but the future as such, that there would be indisputably a future for man and for me as a person. This was not a problematical assumption at all. What I'm saying is that that assumption is not for this generation to be taken as an indubitable and unquestionable assumption. And while that fact ought not to stifle thought or to hamper action, it does give a context for the style of reflection with which students in this generation are engaged, and I think those of us who are talking here must attend to it. I shall later get back to this, but pass on to the second assumption, which is in our theme. When I was about 10 years ago, I think, there used to be a car card on the street cars and in the buses, is there a Ford in your future? The theme for this generation is, is there a future in your future at all? Now the second assumption, can man shape the future? Our theme, of course, assumes that he can. I want to question that. Can man shape the future in such a way as shall be ministerial both to his deepest desires and within limits and by procedures which nature will accept without reprisals. I don't think I need to beat that, that point out in detail. My colleagues have done that. Whoever does not sense that, the force of that presupposition and that question, has not been looking or listening or even smelling. But having raised that question, whether man can shape the future, how shall we deal with it? I would suggest, and I have heard nothing in this conference to cause me to modify this statement, that we are almost totally unprepared, intellectually or emotionally, to take that question seriously as American men and women. For over 150 years, we have thought and acted as if that issue were either clearly solved or on the way to solution by the scientific and technological enterprise, or it was an unimportant or uninteresting issue. Put it another way, we have assumed, and I find little to suggest that beyond a few uh, frantic and perturbed minds who are writing on the subject, the general public is at all interested, 
we have assumed that man has historical consciousness and has dynamic historical operator, has displayed such ingenuity and managerial potency that we have brought the world as nature under such knowledge and control as to bring it within our decisions of the world as history so that we could now regard the world as nature as a latent resource to be managed as our decisional as our decisions as historical beings determined matters to put it still another way the world as history could now stands over against the world as nature in such a way that we regard nature as being acquiescently subsumed under the world so comprehended. I find that massive assumption still largely unquestioned by many distinguished members in the natural and the scientific disciplines. And I might add parenthetically that what the members of those disciplines still do not answer or question at that level is exactly the kind of question that's being asked in Hare, Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, Midnight Cowboy. The first question then simply asks if the presuppositions of a future, the presupposition of a future is unambiguous. The second question asks if our specialized ways of investigation and speaking are not humanly and by the empirical fact of the present embarrassments of our world, if they are not, if they are not so questionable that we must rethink our whole way of knowing. Now I want to break, put the third question, shaping the future. To shape is a verb that evokes images, and all the images are wrong. To shape evokes the image in which you have a relatively inert mass constituted by an actor working upon this mass, clay in the potter's hands, obedient material in the painter's or architect's or engineer's or the sculptor's hands. The image is viciously wrong. In fact, it is a lie. If that lie remains unexposed, we shall confound our problem by such mellifluous statements as shall simply mask the delusion the more horribly. The delusion is that historical man can be rightly related to the world in such a relation as is supposed by the imperial word to shape the future. What I'm saying is that despite our best efforts, we continue to think non-ecologically about ecology. Because all of our reflections upon ourselves, our future possibilities, and what might be good and fulfilling for man, because all of that will be distorted if this delusion persists, I should like to illustrate in several ways the rootedness of that delusion in our common life, as well as in the rarefied levels of intellectual reflection. On the day the huge tanker Manhattan broke through the hitherto unpenetrated Arctic ice, the New York Times headline read, Man's Ancient Enemy Overcome. This is an instance of what Professor Hugh Iltis of the University of Wisconsin has called ecological pornography. And it is the more perilous because the statement is naively uncalculated. The uncalculated reaction of the popular mind disclosed in that headline puts the problem at its really deep level because considered stupidities are less disclosive of men's real problems than these naive reactions are. The Arctic ice, the permafrost, the flora and the biota of the tundra 
have for thousands of years been the context of a supporting ecosystem. They have supported and enfolded a solid and humane culture. The Arctic ice is called in the popular response an enemy. And it is an enemy only from the perspective of the managers of the American oil industry. It is not an enemy to man, to man's world, to man's future. As any earth scientist will quickly tell you, it is one of the vastest, most exquisite balancing, sustaining, protective, and productive structures we know in nature. Huge but delicate, easily upset, and if upset, never to be righted. I take my second illustration from a publication called Catatopias and Utopias, a little booklet published some time ago by the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at Santa Barbara, California. This little booklet records a conversation by a number of heggheads at that place and Mr. Michael Harrington. And Mr. Harrington, in his, in his comment, speaks as follows. One important aspect of utopia, he says, is that we must understand its limits. Some socialist writer, <clears throat> it may have been Trotsky, said that the function of socialism is to raise man from the level of fate to that of tragedy. The function of socialism is to raise man from the level of fate to that of tragedy. I want you to reflect upon that because socialistic, corporate thought, which is highly managerial and planning in its character, raises men when it goes far enough to the level where they see the limits of planning, the uncalculated permutations and novelties and combinations that grow out of the fecundity of the life of history, that there are limits built into the human situation which cannot be planned and would reduce the amplitude of our humanity if they could be. Mr. Harrington continues in this quite remarkable paragraph which I should like to read you. As a matter of fact, I have thought for a long time about Karl Marx's prediction that in a society where men no longer murdered or starved by nature, are no longer murdered or starved by nature, but where nature has brought under man's control, there would be no need of God because God is essentially man's projection of his own fears and hopes. I wonder whether at precisely the moment all economic problems are controlled, there could not be a great growth in reflection about the transcendent rather than a decline. It is a possibility because we would then have a society it, in which men would not die from flood or plague or famine, nor from their own idiocies about the economy, they would simply die from death. At that point, the historical shell around the fact of death would be broken, and for the first time, men would face up, face up to the fact of finitude. The first peril in futurist thinking then resides within the very term we have chosen to advance such thinking. Shaping is the fundamentally wrong term to, with which to address the problem. And the wrong is inescapable if we leave it uncorrected. For a methodological error perverts everything that follows. To shape the future is Olympianly anthropocentric. Now, anthropocentrism is a proper, indeed necessary, starting place for men to begin to think. I would suggest it is a catastrophic place with which to deal with the things they think about. Therefore, I raise a purely formal question. Is thinking about the future as such in, continu in such continuity with what we mean by thinking, 
as to enjoy the term thinking in the same sense with which we use the word when we talk about thinking about the past or the present. Is it thinking of the same order at all? Now, Mr. Wiener uh, reflected somewhat on this yesterday. Now, this question is more than a fussy formality. For thinking about the future does not really deal with data, data in being. By definition, it cannot. Its data are extended, extrapolated, probabilistic. Such thinking may be informed reflection, and as such it is both right and necessary. But it is actually discontinuous with such first-hand or remembered or recorded actuality as constitutes the occasions of thought as we commonly engage in them. But even if this formal difficulty be admitted and the term musing about the future be substituted as more appropriate, there is still another peril. It is, I think, not an incautious speculation to affirm that at the heart of our cultural crisis, and dramatically so as we confront the ecological debacle, is the strong and perduring temptation to transfer models of thought from one realm of discourse to another. Ever since Descartes, a particular way of knowing and of achieving wisdom has been refined, applied, has become virtually normative, and on the ground of its enormous and dramatic efficiency in penetrating and thus utilizing the structures and the processes of the natural world has become the dominant force in the creation of our civilization. One should not be accused of anti-rational bias if he suggests the peril that resides in this success. Michael Polanyi in philosophy, Levi Strauss in anthropology, Mercier Eliade in the history of religions, Martin Heidegger in metaphysics, each in his own way has affirmed that the examination and assessment of data is methodologically perverted if it is brought under realms, realms of organization and categories for assessment which are reductionist in terms of exactly that tradition which has so vast a reputation. When a moment ago I suggested that the problem at the heart of our culture lay at this point, and I think it does, although the young from whom I have learned thus to think may not acknowledge my, my too formal articulation of it, I think at the heart of our dis-ease is a radical dubiety about the whole way of knowing and a way of forming statements and of living lives and of making judgments that proceed therefrom. I, was simply, I am simply proposing for reflection a body of fact with which we are presently overwhelmed and by which men of my generation are overwhelmingly puzzled. What's going on here? The generation gap, the restlessness and anger of the young within a world and self-understanding that has been dominated by science and its child technology, the concentration of contemporary songs short story, modern film, upon the authenticity, the persistence and the promise of the immediacy of personal relations with one another and with the world, a new return on the part of the young to the unutilizable natural, the apparent anti-intellectualism of this generation which is nevertheless using intellectual analysis of the blunders of my generation with a vehemence that my generation was not able to undertake. The perception that the entire value structure and the publicly accredited 
and acclaimed agenda for the good life, both public and personal, the acknowledgement on the part of the young that that good life is utterly incompatible with the achievement of a sane ecology, or the dramatic repudiation of the myth of progress when that myth is supported by evidence of material and technological achievement, such achievements and such progress as leave the poor embittered, the sick neglected, the Chicago schools and Cook County Hospital in decay, while 106 millions of dollars are expounded, expended upon an exposition hall, which is now a building on a shrinking public shore of a threatened lake. All of these facts are trying to say something to us, and we had better listen. Is it perhaps saying this, that in virtue of a new situation, we must undertake a quite fresh transcending of the long solidified and general categories into which our ways of knowing and ways of acting have been dichotomized. This dichotomy is almost absolute. Ever since Fichte, the whole university system has been cloven between the Naturwissenschaften and the Geisteswissenschaften, the realms of discourse that deal with man in the wholeness of his humanity and those with natural sciences which are developed and legitimately for the investigation of the structure and process of the world as nature. In a recent essay, Rosemary Ruther, discussing the history of evolving man's transactions with nature, affirms that a fierce and galloping negative, negative parity has occurred. Man's technological innovations move now in an irreversible fashion in a destructive relationship to the natural environment. Man is destroying the very basis of human and organic life. He is literally eating up the foundations upon which his life is based. I shall not expound, expound the data that justifies such a statement, for I assume our general acquaintanceship with such data suggested the theme of this conference, and my colleagues have supplied much of it. What is clear is that the old walls of division, which have enabled a polite because largely contemptuous discussion between the scientific and the religious communities, that these walls must now be transcended or torn down. For such a new encounter, both the religious and the scientific communities are ill-equipped. The liberal theologians have got on so, so quite well in a pluralistic and uncritical relationship to the scientific enterprise, and they remember their burned fingers of the past too well to return to the questioning. And the conservative or fundamentalists take the present problem as simply a kind of heavenly vindication of theology as the queen of the sciences and are tempted to think of science as simply a naughty child returning to its mother. Both of these old ways of opening the problem, locked within outdated standoffs between an arrogant science and a defensive religion, both of these are incapable of being usefully reopened. What we need is the reopening of a new critical dialogue whose terms are now freshly given to us, both to the scientist and to the humanist, in the matrix of ecological fact. The limitations of a single lecture do not provide much leisure to elaborate how, at the heart of the Christian and Judaic tradition, there does indeed lie an organic and holistic way of regarding man in the world, which seems to me alone profound and ample enough to address us in our cultural need. But reflections upon two aphorisms from St. Augustine, 
will suggest the main lines and vitalities of what I would want to unfold had I the time for it. The first one that I want to ask you to reflect upon, and that reflection, if you take it seriously, will do more for you than anything I say. The first reflection is a sentence from the famous treatise on the Holy Trinity. Non intradit veritatem nisi per caritatem, that is. There is no entrance into truth save by love. Now, Augustine did not mean by that a sentimental or romantic statement about how in interpersonal relationships one opens himself to the other. His statement is based upon the conviction that there is at the basis of the world as nature and at the heart of the world as history, and at the heart of that human world which lives at the intersection of these two, that there is at the basis of the whole of existence a force, a meaning, and a principle that became incandescent in the drama of redemption in which people said, Behold a whole man. And therefore, the word, the logos, that became clear there is not other than that which constitutes the interior life of the world as nature. It is but the incarnation, the incandescence, and the embodiment of it. That is, history and nature, man and his life as an animal in the world of nature, as well as man in the elevation of a potentially dreaming angel, are all of a piece. The ways of knowing then, which ignore or dishonor the holy presence within the world as nature, so violates the creation that silently and slowly, but with implacable judgment, this holy this holy reality, when raped, takes its reprisals. There is no entrance into knowledge or truth save by love. Read for the word love, respect, authenticity, regard for the structured thingliness of things. What G.K. Chesterton once called in a beautiful phrase, before one can be trusted to deal with anything as a man, he must have a love affair with the steeliness of steel and the unutterable muddiness of mud. The second aphorism plays on the Latin verbs to use and to enjoy, uti and frui, and Augustine discriminates and relates these. He says, it is of the heart of sin. Now watch the old boy when he says, I'm going to point to the heart of sin, because he wrote about 20,000 pages on that subject from one angle or another, and when he said it is of the heart, he deserves to be heard. It is of the heart of sin. Now you would have expected him to talk about some vice or blasphemy or idolatry but he doesn't. Listen. It is of the heart of sin that man uses what he ought to enjoy and enjoys what he ought to use. Augustine is saying that if I do not regard the world which stands over against myself in terms of the authenticity of its thingly otherness, so regard it that I, re that I invest it with a holy integrity, over against which I must stand enjoyingly before I can sanely use, then I will surely abuse. He is saying that we must respect, care for, learn from that residency of the grace of the Creator which lies in all that has been created. Learn from it and enjoy the difference and honor its created right to be. 
I will certainly, if I do not do that, I will certainly pervert right use into abuse. And when conversely, if I administer an endowment or a good or a gift, nature or sexuality or learning or faith, if I make that a gift to be wallowed in egocentric, egocentric, uh, centrically, and do not put it to right use in relationship to the other, to, the, to, to my neighbor, to the common life of the world of men, I will certainly abuse. Use without primal joy destroys use, and enjoyment without use destroys joy. Precisely that is what the doctrine of the creation has steadily said for a long time. The doctrine of the creation has really nothing to do with the chronology or the structures of the physical cosmos. It is a vehement declaration that man and nature and history are in an inseparable bundle of a common destiny. The Christian doctrine of God is a way of saying that and it is no fault of the scientific community that the children of that doctrine have often said it so badly that the scientists could not assume or be expected to understand what was being said. The doctrine of the creation has often been veiled by a language of bad science when it ought to have been understood as the high and holy symbolism of the nature of things. At this point, I, I want, to, want to read a poem to you, and I do it not simply because it's a beautiful poem, although to do it for that reason would need no excuse, but because it says with a velocity what I'm saying in a much more halting fashion. And I want to introduce it with these comments. Has it occurred to you that man that to correct man's relationship to nature is not just a problem of the future of his residency within the world as an economic creature. It is a question of man's own identity. It has never been possible for man to dredge up from his own self-understanding language adequate to say the deepest things he wants to say about himself except by using metaphors from the world as nature. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer in this sun of York. My love is like a red, red rose. The periodicities, the turnings of the seasons, the heat and the cold, seed time and harvest, these massive metaphors from the world of nature which are absolutely necessary for man to state his nature forth. These are suggestive that when we say man and nature are in a common bundle, that is not simply an ecological statement of a biological sort. Now it's exactly that, that notion, that man's identity itself cannot be conserved if he deals with the world of nature with other than holy love. And that's what Mr. Richard Wilbur has in a beautiful poem, and I shall skip the first part, but simply say what he's about. He calls his poem Advice to a Prophet. He had apparently, when he wrote this 10 years ago, heard a lot of sermons from Christian pulpits giving people hell about the danger of the atom bomb and how they ought to repent and all the rest of it, and he says, don't give us all those long numbers that rocket the mind. The mind can't even take them in. Can't you find some simpler way to say what a hell of a thing we're doing by dealing with the world this way? Now listen. Nor shall you scare us with talk of the death of the race. How should we dream of this place without us? The sun mere fire the leaves untroubled about us, a stone look on a stone's face. No prophet 
speak of the world's own change. Though we cannot conceive of an undreamt thing, we know to our cost how the dreamt cloud crumbles, the vines are blackened by frost. We could believe if you told us that the white-tailed deer will slip into perfect shade, grown perfectly shy, the lark avoid the reaches of our eye, the jack pine loose his knuckled lip, grip on the cold ledge, and every torrent burn as Xanthus wants, its gliding trout stunned in a twinkling. Now watch it. What should we be without the dolphin's ark, the dove's return? These things in which we have seen ourselves and spoken, ask us, prophet, how shall we call our natures forth when that live tongue is all dispelled, that glass obscured or broken, in which we have said the rose of our love and the clean horse of our courage, in which beheld the singing locust of the soul unshelled, and all we mean or wish to mean, ask us whether with the worldless rose our hearts shall fail us, come demanding whether there shall be lofty or long-standing when the bronze annals of the oak tree close. The ongoing discussion of the limitations to be obeyed in the realm of organ transplants in human subjects brings the matter of our discussion to a particularly dramatic point. In the 1969 spring issue of Daedalus, and the entire volume was given to this theme, Professor Hans Jonas concludes an exacting analysis of the ethical issues in the matter of tissue transplants in human subjects with a paragraph that concludes his essay, and I want to quote it. Professor Jonas absolutely rejects the notion, so operationally regnant in medical science that it is hardly questioned by the doctors uh, who I know across the way at the University of Chicago, that is the theory that what can be done ought to be done. That's simply an unquestioned operating assumption, it seems to me. Professor Jonas denies that. He topples the notion of progress from its commanding position. And in a paragraph of great power and beauty, he calls us back to the primal reality that life most richly and falls within limit. That in the mordant and the rich limit that constitutes experience, one alone learns to love and to use sanely and to accept the mystery of existence. And his final paragraph is this one. If some of the practical implications of my reasonings are felt to work out toward a slower rate of progress, that should not cause too great dismay. Let us not forget that progress is an optional goal, not an unconditional commitment that its tempo in particular, compulsive as it may become, has nothing sacred about it. Let us also remember that a slower progress in the conquest of disease would not threaten society, grievous as it is to those who have to deplore that their particular disease be not yet conquered, but that society would indeed be threatened by the erosion of those moral values whose loss, possibly caused by too ruthless a pursuit of scientific progress, would make its most dazzling accomplishments not worth having. Let us finally remember that it cannot be the aim of progress to abolish the lot of mortality. Of some ill or other, each of us will die. Our mortal condition is upon us with its harshness and also its wisdom because without it there would not be the eternally renewed promise of the freshness, immediacy, and eagerness of youth, nor without it would there be for any of us 
the incentive to number our days and make them count. With all our striving to wrest from our mortality what we can, we should bear its burden with patience and dignity. Now I want to conclude by simply hanging up a couple of things as a kind of a clothesline upon which I hope you will hang your reflections long after I and my colleagues have departed. Play these contrapuntally, contrapuntally, one over against another, in view of what I've said about the whole of existence being a theater of grace. Two statements. Have no thought for tomorrow. Have no thought, be not anxious for tomorrow. And yet that statement was made by a man who did a deed and commanded its declaration in tomorrows that were presupposed. He nevertheless said, have no thought for tomorrow. Could he have done the deed that blesses all the unnumbered tomorrows had he not lived according to the dictum, have no thought for tomorrow? And the second one to play over against that is from the Old Testament, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Does not this suggest that limitation is the precondition of creativity? That fixedness may be a grace. And I end with this then. I have made certain proposals here that we shall have a human future only if some transcendent value is ascribed to that total existence in which man and nature and history constitute an ecological unity. Second, I have proposed that what Judaism and the Christian tradition have meant by the grace of God must find the theater of its acknowledgement, not just in the forgiveness of sins and the sacrament and the sermon and so forth, but in the very giftedness of the natural world as itself a theater of grace. And third, if we thus deal with the world as a grace, is this a verifiable proposition? That is, can I verify the assumption that the world is a residency of holiness and of grace. I would suggest that it just might be a verifiable assumption on this ground. Investiture of all life with holy value and meaning is necessary for the right use and enjoyment of it. What is demanded by men in history and in nature as the absolute precondition of their future may be logically postulated as the reality of God and man and nature and history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sittler. Uh, please leave as fast as you can and write as rapidly as possible uh, so that uh, our intermission can be as short as possible. The monitors will take up questions uh, soon and bring them forward uh, so that they can be dealt with by the panel. Form. Uh, let me begin by a, a question that reads, contemporary writers seem to contend that because youth is aware that no future is guaranteed, it has the uneasiness which it does. 
if we are not to take the assumption that we have a future unexamined, will the four billion of us respond in a cynical hedonist, hedonistic fashion <coughs> or in one compatible with the environment? You can begin as you wish. Bill, do you want each of us to say a word about this? That might be nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I see here in the large three ways. Uh, I mean, if the problem, the problematic character of the future is an element that helps constitute the style of life and mind of this generation, as I think it does, let us assume that as a given, then it seems to me there are three ways on the whole people can respond to that. Uh, hedonistically, apathetically, or gallantly. I mean, you can say uh, the whole thing hasn't got long to go or it has an indeterminate time to go. Let me squeeze all the juice out of it I can. That's one way. And uh, there are those taking that way. Uh, another one is, and this is a much larger group, to sort of uh, sullenly slouch around in the problematic. Uh, and the other way is to say, as the old uh, British ballad has it, let us, friend, lie down and bleed a while and stand up and fight again. Uh, a college exists to invite you to take the third alternative. That's all I have to say to it. Well, my turn. I don't share the feeling, really, that a lot of young people are uneasy about the future in the sense that it's implied here. There's a kind of malaise. No. Surely, you know, so much of the protest that's been going on has hardly been directed hedonistically. Indeed, it's been rather abrasive for the individuals concerned, an extremely painful experience. What has the protest generally been about? Certainly about unease, but mainly about the kinds of human problems that do confront man. Uh, part of it has been about the way in which, perhaps, the vision about present and future has been rather distorted. We're not given you know, a sort of full picture of what, how things are actually going. Most of the directions of the society seem to be directed towards securing the past or securing the conventional and traditional present. I think really one ought to reflect more positively that just at the point when we seem to be endangering our survival on the planet, we rather spontaneously acquire the kind of conceptuality, the anxiety, which gives us the energy to think and do something about it, and the sorts of tools with which you can deal with that amount and staggering magnitude of complexity. Now, we've got the kinds of satellite capability now that can actually enable us to view and tend the Earth as a whole system. We've got the kinds of technical capabilities that enable us to deal with this in detail in many of the types of continents we now have to deal with. We have the kinds of emerging scientific expertise to feed the hungry peoples of the world. The malaise, the unease, the irritation is that we can't get to the job. And mostly the ways in which we can't get to the job is because we have to go through our own roadblocks of conventional thinking, of conventional organization. I don't think the malaise is naive is about the future in a sense, but about a rather laggard present, where change is vastly overdue. Over to me. Well, uh, I can't be a pessimist. I wasn't born that way. And I don't think youth should be that way. In the first place, I think we 
oversimplify. We overdramatize. There was always a generation gap. It's just in a different setting today. There's less space around about us. There are different kinds of problems, but I don't think they're really any greater. You've got better preparation at your age to deal with these problems. We've always had deterioration of the environment. The environment for what? Long before man stepped on this earth, going back to the chaos of uh, the Genesis, uh, depending on how you interpret this, looking at the bones that have been dug up as fossils around the world, and the changes in geologic time that repeatedly have changed this earth, change it will. The only, and it'll continue to change. What we're concerned about, that this change in the environment is so fast that it destroys our human sense of values and our ability to, to make life pleasant, describe pleasant as you will. But the whole biggest trouble in this world is negativism in thinking rather than positivism. And it starts with the U.S. press and television. I'm sick of hearing that news is when dog uh, is bitten by man and that there's no news when it's the other way around. Did you ever stop to pause and reflect on maybe it requires better journalists to make a positive story and there are plenty of them all around about us, good things that are done every day and build them up in a positive way and present them to the people once in a while. About a year ago, listening to the five o'clock news from West Mexico as I drove to the experimental plots which happened to be six o'clock out of San Antonio, I had a little scorecard on my dashboard. And it was simple and bad classification, but it was positive or, or favorable things that had happened in the world, and then some that were middle of the road, and then some that were negative. And after 10 days, between 80 and 85% of all the news releases were negative. Is there any wonder that we have uh, that we have uh, problems in this world if we start out from this point of view. Who could build a winning football team or a winning baseball team or a winning team for life, starting with the negative? And that's what we are. I'm sorry to say, but we've got to start thinking positively. And how many of us do and how often do we do it during the course of each and every day? Too much said. Well, I think the, um, the idea that um, if, if we assume there is no future, it might be a good idea to enjoy ourselves now is essentially self-contradictory to start with because people don't really enjoy themselves in that mood. Uh, the uh, the so-called hedonism, which is based on despair, uh, can't possibly have any uh, pleasure of any importance in it. Uh, so I don't see any basis on which to recommend uh, that state of mind, whether or not um, the future holds um, uh, great hope to us or, or less. Uh, hedonism of despair is a kind of nihilistic and self-destructive mood. And uh, I agree very much with Dr. Sittler that uh, uh, the frame of mind which, which um, uh, we need wisdom about, about the frame of mind with which uh, we ought to approach the future. Uh, it has little to do uh, with what we understand cognitively about uh, what may happen to us, whether or not there is an increased danger of, of nuclear war or an increased danger of ecological problems or an increased danger of a flu epidemic uh, or whatever it is, the future holds lots of hazards and it always has. Uh, but the main thing is that our present is best employed in constructive activity, in um, perhaps stoic, um, positive kinds of efforts to do the best we can with whatever situation we find ourselves in, with what we are given. 
and it usually turns out the best we can, uh, brings a certain amount of satisfaction, and is, after all, pretty good. And I think we ought to distinguish between two meanings of shaping the future. You know, can we really change it? There's a lot of rhetoric about it. Uh, it's beyond our control and we're doomed. Uh, or all we have to do is marshal our efforts and we'll change everything. Well, neither one of those positions is true, obviously. As individuals, we can't do an awful lot about what happens to the world. Uh, even as a society, lots of things are beyond our collective control. Maybe they should be, even. But at any rate, we can't, we can't do anything about it. At some point, you know, the Earth may spin into the sun. The sun may become a nova. You know, all sorts of things that billions of years from now will happen that are utterly outside human control. So the point about shaping the future, though, the reason why the title, even though it's vulnerable to criticism, the title of the symposium has some, something to be said for it, is that what's being talked about here is not shaping in the old way, which, um, which has now become, I think, to thoughtful people so thoroughly um, rejected, although not yet by much of the scientific community and much of the business community. The old way was that we shaped the future because man had been given dominion over the things of the earth and so forth. Uh, and uh, the tundra uh, was our enemy, or at least uh, our prey, or our domesticated animal. Uh, but what we're talking about now, and what Mikhail is talking about, is, is reshaping, maybe deshaping the future, changing the ways in which we had been shaping our future because some of these ways of shaping the future are not going to work out very well, and we now can see that. So it's time to reshape to the extent we can. It's time to um, stop shaping technological and economic things in ways that um, then have consequences for the human spirit uh, that are far more serious and far more pervasive than the minor, relatively minor gains, as we now see, that we got in the technological and economic efforts. But it's very hard to do this. And as I say, we've got to move slowly. We've got to start from where we are to get to where we're going to be. We've got to traverse all the intervening space. We're not going to get anywhere by uh, trying to adapt a radical change in attitude uh, toward our environment, toward economic growth, toward all these other things. But a spirit of reflection and an understanding that science is not wisdom and that science may be helpful. What we need, really need, is not science but wisdom. This is the new understanding we're going to need to search for. Uh, Mr. Sittler, uh, I, if I interpret Mr. Wiener correctly, he is saying that your translation of the phrase shaping the future wasn't the translation he has been using. Uh, I guess the question is, are you addressing some people outside of this building when you criticize the phrase shaping the future, or did you have these people in mind? Yeah, I don't see that... <laughs> I don't see that Mr. Wiener's rephrasing it into reshaping the future addresses my point at all. I'm saying that the, the image of a managerial, anthropocentric agent dealing with an inert nature as if she had no character, vitality, or needs of her own is a wrong, is a wrong image. <coughs> that uh, it's the managerial assumption, the anthropocentric way of thinking about nature. That's the one I'm, I'm griping about, and I, I think rightly so. And therefore the word shaping, I say, is, is wrong, radically wrong. Uh, man has, no man until the Enlightenment ever talked about the world that way, as if something he could shape. He did works upon it, he modified it by canals and irrigation and some work with animals and grains. This is a long history of man's always had a transaction with nature. But it's interesting to read in the history of the Cistercian monks in the Middle Ages how they really saved Western European as an agricultural community and laid the basis for good agricultural practices by, by a kind of almost religious attention to the processes of the integrity of the life of nature herself. They live with nature, not against her or above her. And, uh, and that's why that whole shaping business uh, seems to me to be methodologically set us off on the wrong track. 
Um, I, yeah, if I could just say, I, I agree with that. Uh, and I, I think that that, I, I think perhaps, I'm not entirely sure, but certainly you and I, at least, of the four of us here, will agree on that, and perhaps the others too, that that kind of shaping the future is the kind of thing we can no longer be doing. But what I was suggesting is that when people talk about shaping the future, they don't always mean man's dominion over nature. Uh, shaping the physical world. Sometimes they mean uh, perhaps reshaping ourselves or reshaping our attitudes, changing the thing, if the thing we have been doing mm -hmm. is to behave destructively toward the physical environment. And if we now propose to change something about ourselves and our own understanding of, the, of, of our proper relationship with nature, that is a kind of reshaping. And it's that kind of reshaping, I think, that people have in mind. Well, this, this uh, yeah. if I may butt in, that's, that I, is what I wanted to say. And when McHale says, the problem is he can't get on with the job. You know, that isn't just a problem of human lethargy. I would say it's a problem of profound human cussedness. Uh, here, here you see, we know very well <coughs> the media that have done the, a lot of things that that the other man talked about is so, but the media have also informed us of the defoliation. Hundreds of thousands of acres of land in Vietnam. Now, it's sheer human evil. No wonder the young, you know, in the, in the city of Chicago where I work, no wonder my own kids are fairly disenchanted when they look at McCormick Place, their own school's about to fall in on their heads, and the mayor is inaugurating tomorrow, McCormick Place for 106 million bucks. My brother-in-law, who works at Cook County Hospital, can't get a decent, clean operating room to operate on indigent patients. And they're going to build a sports stadium on some more of the lakefront. And the late Secretary of State had 1,200,000 bucks stashed away in shoe boxes when he died a couple of months ago in a hotel room. Uh, it is. It is a recalcitrancy not only to, to see what needs doing, but a profound prejudice, bias, I've got it made and the hell with you. Sin, in other words. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if we can't get the people in the Lutheran Church of Des Plaines, Illinois, to open their doors to black people, then, of course, there's some question about how far we're going to get on with the job by energy or illumination or enlightenment. I think a higher explosive is needed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just, to yell, just to yell sin at them is not, doesn't prove to be very useful either. And that's why I'm trying to get to the emotional level in what I said to try to get people to see that they do not stand over against the world. We are constituted in unity. It is nature and history and my brother and my identity that are one. That if I act in, an, in, in aggressive egocentricity, this is a kind of suicide. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I would like to disagree that uh, you imply that we are one. We are one, but we are different. Speaking as a biologist, the very essence of survival in this in this world and on this planet is based on the variation within all living populations. And we uh, have certain common senses of values. But in order for man himself, and before this, other living entities were placed here or came to be on this earth, we had to have the ability to shift and adapt to the environment as it was modified. Before we begin to modify this environment uh, by the great numbers that we have amassed in the last few centuries of human beings, the very essence of life is variation, and its survival is deeply uh, involved in this variation. In this room, I think I mentioned yesterday, some of you were pro perhaps not there, there are no two people that are alike, except if we're fortunate enough to have a few rare identical twins present. And we're not only different in our body makeup, color of eyes, and hair, which are very simply inherited things, and the pigmentation on the skin is of no significance. 
These are a few genes in a system of many thousands. This is not important. But we're different in how we react in the environment to the stresses and the pushers, the pushes of both the physical environment itself and in our, the environment that's around about us by, superimposed by our fellow man. And this becomes more and more important. I'd like to illustrate the point. Uh, I agree, Dr. Stedler, that <coughs> Mother Nature is very different, and I speak idiomatically, to mold and to change for good. But as we increase in numbers, we have to learn to deal with its resistance to change for good and to cope with it, or we will so, so, uh, soon arrive at this place uh, that some of us uh, say we have been guilty of uh, uh, moving us toward a bigger, more massive world famine by such a thing as the Green Revolution, which I disagree with. Let's take the case of trying to build in disease resistance in an important variety of crop plants. You will find these genes dispersed in the wild types of plants and you, by crossing you bring them together and you select and you develop a variety that <coughs> will build in protection for losses from, from epidemics of a given disease. But what happens? In the whole system of living things is the ability to mutate and to multiply. And this pathogen, sooner or later, will mutate and destroy that variety. You must be ready again to have something in place of it before disaster strikes. The very essence of life is variability. And what we don't want is to make us all the same, even though too often sociologists and psychologists that do not understand biology, and when it comes to interpretation of law with respect to what's good for society, I'm sorry to say that the lawyers and judges are among the worst biologists in the world. Again, too much said. And the politicians should be added to this category. <laughs> They're the ones that reflect the others. I think you were implying something about this uh, aspect. Yeah, you were illustrating Chicago. my point. Uh, when you talked about variety, it was within an ecosystem. And what I meant by one is that everything, that this enormous proliferation of varieties, mutations, and phyla that stem out and so forth, the whole business is within, within a system, which is comprehensible in virtue of its unification. When Grobstein writes The Strategy of Life, he started talking about mankind with the description of the large molecules in the galaxies, you know. And it'd be pretty Which, How he miserable. found out, I don't know, but... Pretty uninteresting world if we were all the same and striving for the same thing. It'd be monotonous and more deplorable than it is. Uh, could I interrupt? Uh, I've been asked to announce that Dr. Henry Rouse uh, should report uh, from Montevideo should report to the registration desk for an emergency message. And, and I also wanted to try to move on to one, at least one additional question. Uh, the question is, how do you interpret your remarks in the light of Dr. McHale's demands for a pluralistic society <coughs> in which traditional moral, religious, or ethical values leave no meaning for many people? And I'd, I'd like to put a footnote on that and ask what difference your God language made when you attempted to persuade people to appreciate nature? Uh, and how do you see yourself relating to McHale on these questions? You're asking me that? Yes. Yeah, well, I'm working uh, some way, some distance down the road from that, that question. Well, uh, I'm working within a tradition, and let me very briefly state it. Uh, I'm working within a tradition that produced this college in which it seems to me the doctrine of grace has been so encapsulated within the doctrine of redemption, the sacrament, the preaching of the word, the forgiveness of sins, that you come to church and get a new shot every once in a while. And unless we can spring the reality of grace loose and see the world of the creation as a theater of grace, 
we do not release the vitalities of the religious community to have a theological way to address the ecological problem, you see? The Christian theology has a theology for ecology in which it celebrates the holiness of the garden. And uh, that is not the only way to go at the ecological problem, but we're supposed to have something special. And I'm saying we've constipated our speciality in the sacrament. And it's Well, that's a specialized question. Uh, I guess this, the next. Oh, oh, Mr. Weiner. No, go ahead. One. Well, if you if you if anyone wants another comment, I don't want to add another metaphor. That's what I'm worried about at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that a, a different kind of comment on on some of the things. If, if people are trying unsuccessfully to to pick quarrels with John McHale and he, he won't fight back, and I suppose that's very much to his credit, but. And it isn't McHale, really, uh, that, we're, that we're quarreling with. Uh, uh, only a little bit sometimes because people use language which other people use, and they don't mean it quite in the same way. But there is a kind of language which is often used which, which I would like to quarrel with, and that is so many times you hear a call for a radical reconceptualization, or you hear it said, we must change utterly the way we do things, uh, or the system doesn't work, it must be entirely revived, and so forth. And there is the, the great tendency to speak in terms of, um, of absolutes and of wholes. We must change things entirely, radically, fundamentally, basically. All these words get used. Now, I think that's a great mistake. I, th I think that we are, that, as I said before, we are searching here for wisdom. Uh, we are not likely to find that wisdom in analyses uh, which are rationalistic and technocratic and which um, purport uh, to indicate some different way of doing things. We're not likely to find it in some ideological formulation which oversimplifies the reality. Dr. Borlaug has spoken many times of the tendency of people to oversimplify. One way you can define ideology is that it's a, a system of thought uh, which uh, enables you to believe you know more about something than you could possibly know. Uh, such as, for example, uh, what the laws of history are. Uh, but the Marxists have a neat way of accounting for them. It uh, makes it very difficult, by the way, for them to understand how hard-hat uh, workers uh, can be in favor of the war in Vietnam and can be uh, fighting against students who are the sons of capitalists who are against the war in Vietnam. This, this baffles. Uh, the naive Marxist completely. It should work the other way. Um, but at any rate, I don't myself, uh, I'm not able to use the language of theology, and uh, in my mind it isn't necessary to arrive at, at some of these conclusions. But I, it seems to me that when we look for sources of wisdom, uh, we are far more likely to find them in some of the traditional places in our society where they have been, including the theologians, then we are likely to find them in the new analysts. Uh, not because the new analysts aren't good men, intelligent men, and trying hard, but because the problems are too hard, and it's too hard to think them through from scratch, fundamentally, basically. The idea of a radical reconceptualization <coughs> is wrong, mostly because it's too hard to do. Lots of people would like to do it. And brilliant men try, but it's very hard. There are no Newton's laws of society, that, as far as we know. No one has found them yet. Uh, it may be that they don't exist, that it's much more complex than that, and that we will never have a Newton. Well, in that case, let's, let's go back and hear what not only the Christian theologians, but, but the Greek philosophers, others, have been telling us about the human situation and our relationship with nature and so forth. Uh, and it turns out that a kind of, uh, of re a res the virtues of respect for one's surroundings, uh, of, of love, of commitment, 
These things have been mentioned many times through the ages. Uh, let's stick with those and then let's move marginally to try to change the things that we know um, or that we can see are getting us into trouble from a technical basis. And let's also remember, by the way, I can understand your irritation uh, at the fact that uh, the city of Chicago is spending its money uh, in bad ways. Uh, but uh, and here again, uh, this is the kind of thing that has been going on uh, through all the generations. Uh, the pyramids of Egypt were, were built at the cost of the lives of tens of thousands of slaves. Uh, the Colosseum was built at a time uh, when there was uh, starvation and disease through much of the Roman Empire. That doesn't mean that it ought to be done now. Uh, but our standards are much higher uh, than they have been in the past. Our standards are much higher than they were in the 19th century. We talk about the urban slums now. You ought to read some descriptions of what the slums of New York or Chicago were like uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Incomparably worse than they are today. So let's take some heart from the successes we have achieved uh, from the big successes like the Green Revolution, and let's use them as well as we can, but carefully. But hold on. Mm -hmm. All right. You get away with it. <laughs> Good. Uh, I agree with you in part, Jenny, but I'm, I'm worried about this, you know, let's us move, us here, and in many auditoria around the world discussing these kinds of problems. We are always told, in a sense, to move slowly, marginally, to act wisely in accordance with our responsibilities and that sort of thing. But increasingly, as I look at the world and the kind of rational, manipulative powers that exist in that world, they are certainly not moving slowly, <coughs> marginally, and very rationally. That's true. You see, I'm, one is, in a sense, faced with a system which in itself has become a rather out of control and behaves in the most irrational fashion. So I must apologize for my impatience and irritation often with that system. In many cases, we do not have time. We no longer have the margins to make the kinds of mistakes that we made in the past. Uh, and also to come back on Dr. Sudler, one of Dr. Sudler's points. He pointed out you know, that the crisis at the moment is destroying our sense of human values. I think in many ways this is nonsense. The whole debate that's going on at the moment is that we've got human values. We're trying very hard to express them in real terms. We want some things to happen according to those things that we value as human. <coughs> Mostly, people who have power to move events say to us, act slowly. Right. We can get to these things which are value, but at the moment, we have to act inhumanly and in ways that are negative to humanity. I don't buy that. I think it's a bit of a, a non sequitur <coughs> because the fact that people uh, in power are acting rapidly uh, and perhaps irrationally and in ways that do shape the future destructively, uh, it doesn't follow from that that the response to that is uh, to try to mount a counter movement equally violent, irrational, um, uh, uh, and, and large scale in its consequences. The counter movement may simply be uh, uh, to try to, to do the best we can, and, and there may be no substitute for moving slowly if one is to try to improve situations. An irrational response to, to an irrational situation can uh, just uh, result in further chaos. Uh, so that uh, I, I do think that, that it is destructive to call for radical changes in the system just because the system is um, not working well. Uh, it is true that uh, events have larger consequences than they had in the past. It is true that the world is, in a sense, more tightly coupled, uh, that the things we do in one place have greater consequences elsewhere. And the urgency, perhaps, in some ways, has increased. But the fact that the need for, for some positive action, that the urgency has increased, does not lead, uh, does not make it desirable to act precipitously when we still don't know what we're doing. Mr. Sittler, did you want to make a concluding remark? I think we should. Uh... Well, if we have time for another one of those great metaphors I've been thinking of. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as I listened to this interchange, which is very interesting to me, I was thinking of the difference that uh, McHale was, was pinpointing. Isn't it something like this, that for many centuries, uh, 
the changes that did take place were so slow that the world of history and nature was a kind of theater which could sort of stand still while these crazy actors inside could learn their lesson, you know, by mistakes. But now the theater's disintegrating. I mean, we haven't got time. The theater's going to stand still while we make damn fools of ourselves for others. The, the theater of our human existence and the supportive system is being polluted at a rate which is new. This is no doubt about that. So that the analogy is is not uh, the analogy from the Colosseum and the lakefront is not a good one. They weren't dumping crud in the Tiber at the rate we're, <laughs> we're destroying Lake Michigan. But it all comes back to the population problem. <laughs> That's right. Isn't that right? Yeah. It all comes back to numbers of people. That's sure with a little town. Thank you, and the next meeting will be at, at 1 o'clock in Alumni Hall. Oh, 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 oh.